It's full time. Well, it's a round that had just about everything. Plenty of drama late, some big name injuries and even some match review controversy. We'll go through all of it here tonight on Full Time, brought to you by AIA Vitality. I'm Ed Woolley, joined again, of course, tonight by Hawthorne champion Shane Crawford. Crawford, a bit distracted tonight. The Hawks are on. Well, the Hawks are still going. Uh, I knew it would be a good match with North Melbourne. I think North Melbourne are a very good team. But um, there was a lot of great games over the weekend, as there always is. That's why we do this show. Uh, but um, we're going to go through a few and hopefully the Hawks can sneak across the line. Well, these are the results so far in round four. It began back on Thursday night with the Western Bulldogs defeating Sydney. Uh, GWS defeating Collingwood by two points there. What, what games did you really like this weekend, Crawl? Well, I liked the Bulldogs because they were sort of the underdogs. Uh, the Giants had to win and they found a way, even though they haven't been in good form. Port Adelaide just charging along. The Saints... Uh, isn't it good to see the Saints up and about? The Blues, two in a row. Unbelievable. Gold Coast, three in a row. You wouldn't read about it. Brisbane, just keep winning. And uh, the Cats found a way to obviously beat the Demons today. A few of your tips going down the gurgle tonight, I'm told. Hey, not too many. No, I, I actually did all right this weekend, but it's pretty hard from week to week because the unpredictability and the game is played between the ears and at the moment it's very hard to work out. Well, we'll take a close look at some of those matches in a moment. But one of the big talking points of the round was, of course, the incident with Zach Merritt and Jack Silvani. We've had a resolution from the match review officer, Michael Christian, in the past hour. You can see there Jack Silvani leaving hospital this morning. He had a fractured rib and a bruised lung. Croft, he copped a week, Zach Merritt. Do you think that's fair? I, I think the tribunal thought it was Roger Merritt. Um, you know, in the history, he had it with some kind of relation. Zach Merritt shouldn't get a week for that. That seriously is a love tap. It happens probably 20 to 30 times during games where you throw the arm in and you make that player really work for that kick. And I, I think they have to appeal. They really do. Essendon have to appeal this. They've got a big game coming up against Collingwood. Zach Merritt's a very fair player. He was just making Jack Silvani uh, work for the kick. Um, we wish Jack all the very best, uh, but I just think it was just an ab absolute accident. And when you look over the weekend, Tom Stewart broke his collarbone today, uh, just knocking into a player, a Melbourne player, and Jeremy Howe getting his leg wiped out. Obviously, two players going hard from a GWS player. So are we going to get to that stage where we go, do you know what, if you bump into someone and they break something or you hurt their knee, you're out... And I think that's certainly the case with Zach Merritt. I think it's very unfair. Essendon had a hard week last week. They don't deserve to have their star player rubbed out this week. Well, Michael Christian almost has his hands tied at the match review process. This is the matrix he uses, the table he uses to decide what suspension he comes up with. Now, this incident involving Zach Merritt was graded as careless, body contact and, crucially, high impact. That's what gave it the one week. The high impact came because of the injury. So not a whole lot of wiggle room for Chris O there. High impact, please. You're <laughs> kidding. Did you see it? Surely that's not high impact. Well, the impact itself to... is oh, low. Please. But... I know he's ended. And accidents happen in our game and, and unfortunately that's just the way it is. It, it's a tough game, you know. It, it's hard to get through a full season without carrying some kind of injury and this was just an accident. It's not high impact. That's uh, it's an absolute bullcrap. <laughs> so you're saying the Bombers are going to the tribunal tomorrow night? I think you have to appeal. Like, please, Zach Merritt deserves to play on the weekend. He doesn't deserve one week. Please appeal this and let's get on with it. We'll take a closer look at that uh, later in the week. Essendon perhaps going to the tribunal if Shane Crawford... Bullcrap. ...their <laughs> well, we'll look now at the matches and there was a dramatic finish, as we mentioned this afternoon. Melbourne up against Geelong and the Dees almost snatched it late. Yeah, they're going all right, Dees. They put good pressure on. They're just having trouble connecting through the midfield and forward. Geelong are a very good side. They structure up really well, got great experience. They zigzag their way forward and, and they use um, the right angles to get the ball uh, into the forward line really well. Uh, but it was a really good game. Two sides having a real crack. I know people are going to argue that the game <laughs> has lost its way, but just two sides being very desperate to try and get another win on the board and the Cats finding a way. I think you knew what I was going to say next, didn't you, Shane? No, I, no I, 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 I had a problem with that match. It was close. It was close, but I don't think it was a great match. I don't think it was an overly enjoyable match for the neutral spectator. And that brings us now to, to what Chris Scott said after the game. He was quizzed about coaches and their responsibility to the look of the game. Um, the short answer is, yeah, I think we do have a bit of a responsibility. But I think the responsibility is more with the rule makers um, and with the AFL. I think I'm on record as saying my view is they ask the coaches too much. 
I'd, I'd rather invest less time thinking about how we can make the game better so I can just do my job and have other people be empowered to do the things they need to do. So if we want to make the game less congested, last week we played Carlton in some match practice, 16 v 16 at Geelong, and it was exhilarating. 14 v 14 versus Melbourne at Port Melbourne. And once one team got the ball and moved it fast, you couldn't stop them. Um, but I hear the traditionalists say, you know, stop mucking around with the game. It's never going back to what it was. And in my opinion, thank God. But even if you wanted to go back to what it was, that's not going to happen. So either you want to change the game and open it up, so empower the people who are decision makers to do what's required, or leave it the way it's always been and it will get what we get. I'll do whatever they tell me to do. Yeah. And, and th that's my mindset. Mm. I think less asking, more telling. And secondly, if your issue is congestion, you want the ball to flow better and make it harder to defend, reduce the number of players on the field, increase the number of players rotating, and the ball will ping around, and it will be so hard to coach and so hard to defend. Well, it's a bit of a different roast this week, Croft. I love footy. I love footy. But uh, and I'm not one of those people that's always bought into the talk of it used to be better back in the day, but I've really struggled this year with some of the matches. I feel like the coaches are perhaps stifling the game a little bit, and I know Chris was, was quizzed on that. He just wants to win the game, but do you have a problem with the way footy's being played at the moment? Absolutely. I think you've got a COVID hangover. We're wanting football <laughs> to come back. We want close games. I hate one-sided games. That's a pet hate for mine, but I know at the moment, you've got to understand, these players, they're not allowed to do uh, contact work at training. They only have one day where they can all come together as a group. So we need players normally in a, a w normal week. You're doing contested work three or four times during that week. You're really working on body craft and, and stoppages and so forth. They're not allowed to do that at the moment. They're only allowed to train in their eights. So it makes it very, very tough. I totally agree with Chris Scott. If you take a few players out, the ball will ping along. You'll kick more goals. But you love that battle, that contest. You want defences pushing back. At the moment, the coaches are just doing their very best to put a lot of numbers around the stoppages. Makes it very hard to work your way through. You have to switch the ball and keep the ball moving. But the way players with fitness levels these days, they can push across the ground really well. They're zoning space, not necessarily man on man like the game used to be. I just think, give it a few more weeks and we'll see the true game where it's at and we'll get a, a true indication of where it's been. And we need to let the players get back training and working hard against each other and that'll have a real flow and effect into the games. I guess, Croft, all affected by shorter quarters, of course, and so that is going to bring the scores down. But my argument is, and there's obviously less pressure... You want in... more goals, do you? Love a couple more goals, Shane. We, we don't need too many more goals. You, you want a contest. <laughs> I don't want these one-sided games where teams kick, you know, 25 goals and the other team kicks 20. That, that for me, is not a contest. I, I love how the defenders are just pretty much putting up a brick wall. I love how the forwards are trying to work their way through. The midfielders are getting tired, but they're trying to find, you know, avenues to goal. I, I love, you know, from a coaching point of view, from a playing point of view, it's a contest. You know, if we're going to take numbers out of the game, we might as well take contact out of the game. We might as well just <laughs> start playing a different sport. Oh, now, you, now you're starting to misquote me a little bit. But you're a midfielder, Shane. Now, what would your forward, ex-teammate forward, some of those guys, like your Buddy Franklins or your Jason Dunstall's, what would they say, do you reckon, with the way the ball's coming down to the forward? Well, it's very hard for key forwards to kick bags of goals. Yes, I, I get that. So I think if you're going to start fiddling with the numbers, yeah, maybe you fiddle with the numbers and only allow a certain amount of players into a forward line. But you've got to remember, this weekend, the thing about uh, kicking a lot of goals... You've got your midfielders pushing up and, and coming through and you have someone like Lockie Neal, who's one of the best midfielders going around, he kicks six points and his teammate Hugh McCluggage, he kicked one goal five and they're starting on ballers for the Brisbane Lions. So I just think just, just give it a few more weeks, let it all settle down and we'll work out a true indication of where the game's at. Well, it's taken a couple of weeks, but the tension's just raised a little shame. Oh, I'm very little... tense for a Sunday. I just want a Sunday roast, <laughs> kick back and watch the Hawks try and win a game. <laughs> well, great segue on Lockie Neal and Hugh McCluggage. We'll take a look now at the Lions' win over the Crows this afternoon. It was fairly comfortable in the end, but it should have been a whole lot more comfortable. 
Yeah, well, you've got Dane Zorko who went out with an injury early on. You wanted the Adelaide Crows to step up and show a bit, and they were. They were competitive, especially in that third quarter. They showed a bit of fight. But um, the, the problem for me, the Brisbane midfielders are having too many shots on a goal. So Adelaide have got a lot of uh, worries. Um, you know, their senior-type players just weren't contributing to the, the level that you want. And it's going to be a long road this year. They've just got to hang in there, keep fighting the best they possibly can. But the Lions still haven't played their best footy and they're winning. So that, to me, is a real sign. Uh, watch out for the Brisbane Lions as the season unfolds because at the moment, every time they go forward, they're going with big numbers. And that is why the midfielders are having an influence on the scoreboard. But I think once you come up against some better sides, you've got to be very careful how you attack in the forward line and you've got to make sure your zone's set up really well. We touched on Lockie Neal. Zero goal six for him. He's taken to social media this afternoon to <laughs> apologise to some of his supporters. According to my Twitter feed, a fair few had me for a goal in their multi. <laughs> Apologies, I owe you all a beer. Were you one of those? or? No, I wasn't, but that's a lot of beers if someone... Because he's in <laughs> wonderful form at the moment, Lockie Neal. And um, any midfielder that can hit goals, so valuable to a team. Do you think he's a Brownlow favourite at the moment? Oh, he has to be, yeah. I reckon... His second half today was outstanding. Um, he got a lot of close attention early, but the problem is you try and stop him um, and, and stop any influence he can have on a game in the first half. Yes, they did OK, but they were still in front by 40 points at half-time. So you, you've got to go in with that team defence attitude, not necessarily, you know, man-on-man. Man. doesn't necessarily work. Well, speaking of midfielders kicking goals, Shane, you've been keeping a close eye on Chad Wingard this afternoon. Uh, he's having a great year. Um, he's playing a lot through the middle. He's kicked a couple of goals. He's had about 16 possessions, took three-quarter time. Um, and he's just a, one of those players that you want to have the football. So the Hawks look like they're heading towards a victory, although we know this game, things can change pretty quickly. But uh, they're setting up really well. The, the biggest thing for them was to, to come off a very good win last week and back it up, and it looks as though they're heading that way. A big out for North Melbourne was uh, Cunnington. I think he's just an absolute star. So I think that was a big advantage for the Hawks going into the match, even though he was a late withdrawal. But um, North Melbourne are going to have a good year. I'm pretty sure about that. But uh, I think the Hawks are just clicking in the gear and they're going to be very tough to beat. Well, Ben Cunnington was a laid out for the Ruse. There was also an intriguing one at Hawthorne. John Patton, of course, has faced a bit of scrutiny. The Hawks said he was out with a foot problem. Yeah. They brought in <laughs> Mitch Lewis, so perhaps a bit of ducks and drakes there from Alistair Clarkson. But if you're on the match committee, who, who's playing from week to week at the moment? Because it seems like it's one or the other. Um, well, Lewis came a long way last year. Um, he was really working into some really good form. But Patton hasn't played a lot of footy, so you want to give him exposure at the highest level. Um, maybe, maybe the MCG is a better fit because a, a big ground, a bit more space to allow Patton to work into the game. And I'd like Patton to possibly play through the ruck at times. But uh, I think Hawthorne are just looking after it at the moment. You've got to remember, what is it, two years pretty much without a lot of football. So it, it's, it's not an easy game. And sometimes players like that will take a whole year to really find some form. So look out to <laughs> 2021. That may be when Jonathan Patton really shines. Well, that brings us now to the four points from round four. And Shane, who have you got this week? Well, I'm going to start with goal kicking. Uh, when you get an opportunity to kick goals, you must put it through the big sticks. It's not that hard. Don't overthink it. Degoe's missing easy ones. I saw Charlie Cameron. Lockie Neal kicked six points on the weekend. McCluggage kicked one goal, five. It's not good enough. You need to kick the goals when you get an opportunity. Uh, Darcy Parrish, uh, he needs to play through the middle. I know he can kick goals. I think he's... Best quarter on the weekend was the last quarter. A few weeks ago when the, against the Swans, he was up and about, had 13 touches in the last quarter. He needs to play through the middle, especially with Zach Merritt out. Unlikely heroes. The Blues, two in a row. The Saints, how good. They defeated the Premiers. Gold Coast, three in a row. And, of course, Port Adelaide on top of the ladder, undefeated. And key forwards, Charlie Dixon, they're back. About time, you know, I remember Jason Dunstall, Tony Lockett, some of the all-time greats. It's great to have uh, key forwards really uh, having a huge influence on the game and have a look at Charlie Dixon there. He's got a six-pack. It's very rare for a full forward to have a six-pack. Well, if you go back to Lockett and Dunstall, that definitely didn't happen, but uh, <laughs> a different moving and type of forward these days. We're talking about some Hawthorne legends there, Shaman. It has been actually an emotional week 
um, down at Waverley, hasn't it? I mean, after the passing of John Kennedy Senior on Thursday, age 92, I'd imagine he'd had a big impact on, on everything you'd been a part of down there. Well, he, he was incredible. And uh, as Alistair Clarkson said, he very much was the godfather figure. Um, and he really changed Hawthorne. He, uh, he brought in that real hard training. Kennedy's commandos had, him, had them running... Uh, through the sand dunes and training like never before. But it was all about teamwork and, and helping each other and making sure you got the most out of yourself. And, um, yes, he's, he has uh, been someone, whenever they were uh, floating through the football club and whenever we were lucky enough to, to have him talk to the, the players, it's just incredible. You really did want to run through brick walls and get out there and play, even though it was during the week trying to G you up for the weekend's match. And he was a real mentor and guide for Alistair Clarkson. Well, sorely missed, but also uh, remembered by everyone down there at Hawthorne, of course, in the future. Don't think Dewey's famous saying. I'm sure you carried that with you. Well, time now for a change of pace here on full time. And mental health has been such a prevalent topic of discussion among uh, the AFL at the moment. We'll head across the ditch now to someone who I guess has pioneered that discussion in New Zealand. All Blacks legend, Sir John Kerwin. Sir John, thanks so much for your time tonight. Great to have you on. Oh, nice to be here, lads. Just call me JK, please. I get a bit uncomfortable here. <laughs> no, Sir John well, we... Kerwin. You've got uh, Sir Shane Crawford here and Sir Anton <laughs> Woolley. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Now, a bit of a background. Uh, you, you played for the All Blacks. You were one of the all-time uh, all greats. You also coached uh, overseas. You coached Japan. And who else did you coach? Yeah, I coached Italy and Japan. So I went uh, at the end of my career. I had a little stint as a manager of the Blues. Then I went over to... Uh, to Italy, and I was assistant for a year. Then I coached them uh, to a couple of World Cups, and then went to Japan 2006 or 2011. Came home to New Zealand and uh, took on uh, the mighty Auckland Blues. Didn't work out too well, actually, so uh, I'm not coaching anymore. And you do have an Aussie Rules connection because during uh, the juggernaut that the All Blacks uh, were on fire, especially during the 80s and I think during the 90s, you actually had an Aussie Rules connection. Yeah, Mickey Byrne. So he said, JK, whatever you say, you're a hawk, son. Forever. Mickey Byrne. So he was our <laughs> kicking coach, and uh, I knew nothing about, um, you know, this great sport that really, for me, your sport probably should be celebrated all around the world. Because if you think about all the excuses that all the other sports make about not being, you know, successful global game, and yet your sport has been amazing in its growth and continue, you know, tribalism and traditionalism, uh, Mickey took us to a couple of games. But I, the hardest thing I remember, mate, was the All Blacks took us to the MCG once and we trained on the field that you guys train on. How do you do that? It's way too big. It was terrible. We were buggered. Unbelievable. Well, plenty of trials and, and tribulations at, at top-level sport. And as part of that, you've developed an app, I guess, to, to help deal with that. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, during my career, um, I had a, a depression, a medical depression. So basically, I wanted to jump out of a window one night in, uh, on an all-black tour in Argentina. And uh, luckily, my teammate said, JK, you've got a good heart. And uh, what happened was I finally got home, opened up, spoke to my family first, then went to a, to a specialist and sort of just... I don't like the word journey, but I went on this journey of, of wellness. So I, w I would say I was just surviving and then I learned all these tools and techniques and that keep me incredibly well today I feel as if I'm thriving today so what we did is um, you know we interviewed 3,500 people and we realized that you know um, stress and anxiety is the new norm so what we wanted to do is deliver you know a an app called Mentimia that gives you the tools and techniques that you need just to stay well on a daily basis. I mean, a lot of this information is out there, but it's as boring as batshit. What we wanted to do was actually deliver it in a really engaging way. And uh, during COVID, um, we decided to give it free to New Zealand. And obviously, we wanted to give it to our um, Australian brothers and sisters. So we've launched it in Australia as well. And you teamed up with AIA. So for the next six months... Um, it's free to everyone to get involved and obviously with AFL football we've had a lot of players over the last few years come out and express where their feelings are at which is very unusual to the way it used to be 10 years ago which is, which is something we all can get out of it so it's, it's very encouraging when we actually hear our heroes express how they're feeling, where they're at and what they're doing to move forward and hopefully stay on top of things. 
Yeah, you've had some amazing role models that have come out and talked about it. We've, we've all got mental health, right? I mean, I guess the biggest story I can tell you is, is I didn't talk to anyone. I was having anxiety attacks and it fell into a depression. And I went to a psychiatrist. I was so embarrassed to go to a psychiatrist that I booked an hour before, my hour and an hour after, because I was too scared someone would see me. But now I walked in, she said, I'm a rugby player, eh? And I said, yeah, yeah. She said, what would you do if you had a tight hamstring? I said, well, I'd stop and stretch it. She said, okay, what happens if you get up and you keep running, it gets really, really tight. And I said, well, I'd ice it and go to the physio. You know, she said, well, your brain's no different, mate. And that just really clicked for me. You know, I had a tight hamstring in the head. I, I, I needed some ice and I needed to know who the physio was. And I think that what we're trying to do is just say that this is normal. And also mental health is not prejudice. And right now during COVID, it's a pretty stressful time. So, you know, it's important that people start talking about it. I mean, in our era, you know, no one spoke about it. It was seen as a real weakness, but it's not a weakness, you know, it's an illness. But if you get this illness early enough, and that's what we wanted to do with Mentoneer, a lot of the, um, you know, help us ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. But what we wanted to do was put a fence at the top of the cliff and then move that fence back. So just really simple tools and techniques to keep yourself well. Well, JK, Sir John, thanks so much for your time. I've got to call you Sir John. JK doesn't seem quite right just at the moment. All Blacks legend, thanks so much for imparting that knowledge on us. The Mentimea Mental Health app, we'll keep an eye out for it. A, a great message. Yeah, go the Hawks. Is that what I'm supposed to say? Go the Hawks? Yes, go the Hawks. Good on you. <laughs> Well, Shane, I think a great way to finish the show for tonight, an important message. Yeah, a very important message. And um, it's just great to see the two countries coming together and, and sharing the love. And we all know that, um, you know, it's, it's a really delicate um, space at the moment. And um, when you've got heroes like that, and he, he is like one of the all-time greats, really, when you talk about uh, rugby union um, in New Zealand. So it was great to have him on the show. And um, hopefully people... If they do need a little bit of help and a little bit of guidance, get onto that Mentimea app and uh, hopefully that can help them get back on track. Well, Shane, thank you for your company and thank you for your company. We'll be back again next week with Full Time brought to you by AIA Vitality.